Okay. Go. Are we filming now? Yes. But you're moving it. Okay? Yeah, okay. Three, two, one, go. Ryan and I set sail for Katuit in a 16-foot boat affectionately known as a Hairshoff dough dish. The sailing craft was gaffed rigged, has a gaffed rigged mainsail and club footed jib. We cleared the sands of Deadneck and set to a beam reach southeast toward the lone Cape Wind weather tower, standing thumb tall on the most distant corner of Horseshoe Shoal. Steering for the tower, we trimmed sails at regular intervals until we were close hauled with the sails pulled in tight. The tower seemed to us to be climbing to windward becoming more difficult for the hair shaft to steer for. We were forced to come about and tack the boat before the wind a few times to gain the tower. The sea was like a conveyor belt moving two or three knots to the west while the tower stood firm on the shoal just out of reach. Nearly fetching the tower we sailed downwind for home. Then, when the, Just then the wind suddenly died away entirely. This is Nantucket Sound, and in the middle of the sound is Horseshoe Shoal, which is shaped like a horseshoe, and it's open to the east. And the weather tower is on the farther tine of the horseshoe, right about here. So we literally are halfway between Hyannis and Nantucket, is where the weather station is. And the current is going out, going out this way and we want to go north and so it was kind of a bummer to be on this conveyor belt and seeing these lighthouse these water towers moving off to our right so we sat there becalmed until it was clear that the three water towers on the northern cape cod shore were steadily marching off to our right to the east the outgoing tide was taking us west at about two knots we were being pulled toward a stretch of water funneled between the Falmouth shore closing in on the right and the Martha's Vineyard shore at Oak Bluffs on the left. Lacking an engine and with the tide taking us perpendicular to where we wished to go, we resorted to taking out from under the starboard wooden bench a long canoe paddle. We took turns pulling for shore while the others steered the boat. Each turn at paddling was up close and personal with a tranquil sea. Drawing the paddle into the seawater, the pale brown ash blade darkens to mahogany color before disappearing into shallow depths. Brown water becomes opaque 16 inches from the surface. This is disquieting because this should be blue water. I'm paddling offshore six miles south of Cape Cod halfway to Nantucket Island, in the middle of Nantucket Sound, and the water is not blue, it's brown. Seawater color is the direct result of nutrients, including phosphorus and mostly nitrogen. Nutrients are taken up by algae. Benthic animals in Nantucket Sound, the bottom fauna, suffer. Slipper shells, moon snails, spider crabs, and horseshoe crabs all host slimy filamentous algae in long trails off their topsides. Nutrient-fueled green slime is not a healthy environment for fish and marine life. Sea turtles pass through Nantucket Sound but do not dwell here and they are rarely seen. There are those who worry about the aesthetic of Nantucket Sound being destroyed by windmills. I now worry about Nantucket Sound destruction by nutrient overloading. The waters here are so brown that outstretched fingers disappear from sight before my elbow touches water. Nutrient overloading causes algae to bloom, to reproduce rapidly. Sometimes the blooming algae consume so much dissolved oxygen in seawater that the organisms die. Water turns deadly brown, depleting even more oxygen when green slime decomposes into brown detritus. Devoid of oxygen, the area goes hypoxic, and an ocean dead zone is created. Fortunately, I have yet to find an ocean dead zone in Massachusetts water. 
However, I fear this will only be a matter of time and effort looking for stressed ocean areas. The loss of offshore blue began on the shore, on Cape Cod and the islands. Much is being done by municipal and state governments to stem the flow of effluent from cesspools and septic systems. With each heavy rainfall, nutrients are washed directly from fields, lawns, and parking lots into waterways to the sea. More needs to be done to stem non-point source pollution with better buffer zones between lawns and pervious surfaces and waterways. Buffer zones are needed between the domestic and the wild. The coastal waters of Nantucket Sound are protected from dumping by the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuary Act. Unfortunately for my right hand at the paddle's throat here on Horseshoe Shoals, the waters are not protected. Vessels are free to discharge effluent because these are federal waters circled by a three-mile ribbon of state waters, a pool within the sound. Here in the wild frontier middle, vessels dump whatever they please. According to recent complaints, public ferry boats going to and fro the islands are doing just that. To their credit, some ferry boat operators, such as the Steamship Authority, are taking steps, making the investments that will enable their vessels to cease discharging. To be in the middle of Nantucket Sound is to be in the nutrient overloaded vortex of the rich and famous, ringed by a mega McMansions and traversed by overcarbonated Tupperware toys. Construction vessels will soon join the fray to build windmills on Horseshoe Shoals. They, like everyone else, are free to throw their tea into this precious realm of ocean. How much nutrient loading can Nantucket Sound take? How much sliming of the sound, desecration of the deep, before we act to reclaim blue waters once more? For too long, no one has spoken for the waters, for the ocean ecosystems so impacted and burdened by human waste. We can act to turn Nantucket Sound waters from brown to blue, going against status quo, status quo and perceptions, in some respects, will be going against wind and tides. Polluters will claim to not pollute for them is a hardship. They'll cry that this is government interfering with free enterprise. Greater hardships are suffered by ocean users, the recreator and the workers. It is my hand on the canoe paddle throat that dips in and out of the brown swill, not the hand of the polluter squawking of government-caused hardships. Being federal waters, Nantucket Sound belongs to everyone to despoil and to no one in particular to protect. These are our natural comments and without individuals speaking up, without enviro guardians, tragedy of the commons will continue. Being federal waters, those portions of Nantucket Sound can be protected from vessels discharging waste by legislation from Washington. And congressional representatives have told me that they would like to see Nantucket Sound so protected if only local users can get it together. Together, we can cleanse the brown and bring back the blue to these ocean waters. If you would like to learn more about our efforts to improve oceans seamlessly linked to watersheds, visit us online at oceanriver.org. You're welcome to sign up for e-alerts at www.oceanriver.org, or you may write to me at rob at oceanriver.org. In this episode of Ocean River Shields of Achilles, we have learned about a watershed very important to me. In the next episode, I'll be back in a different watershed talking with people who know it best. We'll discover what is being done to better and to restore an ecosystem. By thinking locally and acting locally, we become more global in our stewardship of the planet. Until next time, the Ocean River Shields of Achilles, for Ocean River Shields of Achilles, thank you for sojourning with us in Katuit Bay and Nantucket Sound.